Hey folks, welcome back to season two, episode 10, the season finale of our second season of Corex and Coffee Cast, where we're all about bringing new gamers into the hobby as well as supporting gamers at every level. I'm your host, Pete Steele. And I'm your other host, Rick Hendricks. And we're all about pushing back hard against that stereotype that board gamers and nerds are asocial beings. And we'll be doing that today by discussing solo games. Well, that's fine. I mean, it's COVID, it's pandemic, it's whatnot. But Rick, exciting news. It's not just you and me because we actually have Keegan King, our producer here with us today. Hey, Keegan. Hi, everybody. Keegan, thank you so much for all you do behind the scenes. It's really great to have you here with us today. Absolutely. It's exciting to have you on the podcast. Thanks, guys. I always get weirded out on this side of the recording, right? Like I'm always in the end of all the episodes, but now I'm here in the beginning. It's weird. It's cold. How do you do it? You might be in the middle too, is unless you run away. I mean, I'm attached to the computer at this point, so running would be very silly. That's fair. We do also want to thank uh, Ms. Shaw and our other behind-the-scenes people who make Corax and Coffee possible. So like Rick mentioned, we're going to be talking about solo games. We're going to be doing a top 12 solo game kind of countdown or thing we kind of end each season but it's really a top four from each of us it's not one kind of cumulative top 12 list that we've come up with together we each have our top four favorite solo games so rick kick us off with your number four so i'm gonna start us off with four against darkness by ganesha games Ooh, I'd considered talking about this one. I do actually think I reference it later on, but man, this is a divisive game. Good choice. Yeah. Four Against Darkness is a dungeon delver which randomly generates an entire dungeon for the adventuring party you build to explore. So you're playing every character by yourself, no miniatures, you draw your own maps as you go, bring some six-sided dice, and you're in business. If you're looking for the tactical combat side of your role-playing game in a solo setting, Four Against Darkness can let you enjoy some of that crunch that you might be missing out on in some of the story-driven games we'll be talking about later. I really like Four Against Darkness because there's a lot of extra content available. You're very unlikely to run out of new dungeons or encounters. Some of these modules also give you some story and missions to sink your teeth into, and a surprising number will change up the feel of the game significantly with some changes to the rules. What type of rules changes are we talking about? And not only what, what kinds, but what made the game better for you? One of them that I really enjoyed was Night of Destiny. Night of Destiny changes it from a party of four adventurers to focus on a single hero and his quest for the Holy Grail, which really changed the feeling of the entire experience. The best bit was that one you can get for just $2. That's the digital version, but $2, you can't beat that. We've also got a Four Against the Abyss, which is another one of these expansions, and it levels up your party significantly, and it covers some more of that underdark feel, where you're starting to drift farther and farther from things that you know or understand. So why is this your number four? So this is my number four because... It, it is a lot of work to draw the map by yourself. It's not necessarily one you can just sit down and cuddle up with quite as easily as some of my others. And no particular shade on Four Against the Darkness, but some of the other ones are really great. I had kind of the same experience. It's funny you mentioned Night of Destiny. There's also an Alone Against the Darkness, which is a horror one. And obviously I'm the horror guy, so also a lot more compelling. The thing, mm -hmm. the part that I had the hardest time with this game is that you need to have uh, graph paper. Yep. Which is always kind of a challenging component to have. Like how many people, just, I mean, I have it laying around, but not everyone does. Sure. I mean, it, you know, it's easy enough to get your hands on it, I suppose. I mean, you could certainly do without it if you want. It does make some of the maps a little bit more difficult. So this is an interesting generational thing, because while I'd be hard-pressed to find graph paper around my house now, I'm sure I have some, I just remember 20 years ago when I was doing all sorts of hex crawls and dungeon crawls, I, I couldn't turn anywhere in my room or my space or my house without finding a pad of graph paper. I mean, it was everywhere for gaming. And that's not the case for me anymore. So I, I, I haven't thought about that until just that just this moment. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree with you. I think that it is a generational thing. Obviously, I do a lot of math stuff in my non-podcasting life, and so I have it laying around. And there's always going to be a part of me that loved doing my own like maps and stuff for D&D, &D, but I haven't DM'd in a while mm. is the other thing. And I think that's a difference between you and I, Peter. I remember... 
you've DM'd a little bit more recently than I have. And uh, yeah, so as somebody who doesn't DM, just plays graph paper also doesn't show up a lot. So it's just a thing to think about. Yeah. Well, and if you are DMing, graph paper might not play in too much either because it's kind of a small scale. Sure. Yeah. I generally go with a vinyl mat if I'm drawing my own games, you know, because it needs to be bigger and more accessible for more people. All right. And my number four for solo games is actually Hostage Negotiator. And I want to say that going back to weird generational stuff or just generational stuff, when I'm playing a video game by myself, I can't play modern stuff. I can't deal with spin up or load times or cutscenes or anything like that. I just want, you know, cartridge plug and play so I can play for five or 10 minutes on my own and then turn off and go make lunch or go, you know, hang out with the cat or whatever I'm doing. The point is, if I'm, if I'm playing on just by myself, I don't have the emotional energy to do tons of setup, whether it be a video game or a board game. And so there are tons of great solo games, elaborate solo games, or games that have really wonderful solo modes, but take tons of setup time and breakdown time. And I love playing those games with other people, but I'm not going to do all of that setup time on my own for fun. You want to be able to get in and get out. I want to be able to get in and get out. And there are certainly going to be some exceptions to that on this list. But Hostage Negotiator, where I, I don't I don't love it as a game. I think there's too much dice chucking, but I love it for its get in, get out, plug and play solo aspect. You can play this in a cafe. It was released by Van Ryder Games in 2015, and you play as a police hostage negotiator. And I know in 2022... Not everyone is cool with the police. Not everyone was cool with the police 20 years ago, and I do understand that as a major concern. I do want to say that a lot of the characters in the game are uh, represented by a number of different minorities and people of color. I think that's great. That doesn't solve the police issue, so your mileage may vary on that, but I did want to just kind of throw out that little PSA in that, that so in this game, you're constantly chucking dice. You can play it in 10 or 15 minutes. It's customizable. It's expandable. You can vary the difficulty settings. And you might even be able to get away with wearing sunglasses indoors while you're playing this game. I don't know. With all apologies to George Michael and the band Wham. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I think a con of Hostage Negotiator is that it is so dependent on the roll of the dice. You might take risks and they might pay off and they might not. But either way, it will not be due to your cunning or brilliant decision making as a player. It will be due to the dice. And that very rarely, if ever feels great for a lot of players. I guess it's a way to enhance replayability. It's difficult to add something unpredictable to a game without adding randomness when you only have one game to work with. But uh, So you can't even make an educated guess about what these dice are going to say. Well, sure you can. I mean, they're, they're six-sided dice. I can make one out of six chance that... <laughs> oh, sure, but... You have a yeah. 17% chance of figuring it out. But, for example, in, in D&D, I can bet that my character will be good at something that they're good at. Right. And I may be wrong, but it's a, it's at least a calculated risk, you know? So in Hostage Negotiator, you have um, a hand of cards that you can use to, like, take bonuses on certain dice and things like that, pros and cons of that. So you can make an educated mm -hmm. guess to dice rolls to an extent based on the cards that are in your hand. So it's not entirely random in that way. I'm not particularly impressed with the artwork or the graphic design of the cards or the player board in Hostage Negotiator. Designs tried to create some sort of modern age digital realism. And while I applaud the concept, I think that they wanted some sort of like grit in the game. That is a very unforgiving kind of <laughs> graphic design template. And it just didn't quite work. The cards ended up looking kind of amateurish and it kind of screwed with my suspension of disbelief. So they were going for an aesthetic and they kind of missed it. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the, the artwork very much made me feel like I was playing a game about being a hostage negotiator rather than making me feel like I was actually a hostage negotiator. I actually tried turning on certain like hostage negotiator themed movies in the background, like Hostage Negotiator. Um, that's Kevin Spacey. That's not a great thing to reference right now. I'm over two, but I... Yeah, we're, we're in a weird spot we with are. the cop stuff already in the cultural zeitgeist. Let's tread lightly here. There's recently a huge uproar on Twitter against Paw Patrol, so there really isn't like a, a barometer we can go That's with. That's fair. Also, just real quick, Corey Hart, not... I'm going to leave it in my mess up from before, but it was uh, Corey Hart who sang Sunglasses at Night. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you were watching these movies. Yeah, so I was watching these movies, and I was trying to immerse myself, and it... it it 
kind of worked a little bit. Much like, you know, when you're playing space battles from Jedi while you're building your Lego Death Star or whatever. I don't know. And yes, I, I absolutely have done that. I've done that twice. But I do love the plug and play aspect of this game. And there are some expansions for it. Hostage Negotiator Career, which kind of adds, adds a campaign element and takes, it's, you're still chucking dice, but it takes some of the, it does take some of the feeling of randomness away, even though that dice checking is still there. And then you have Hostage Negotiator Crime Wave, which just adds more content and a storage solution. And you actually do need Crime Wave to play Career. And there are a number of kind of expansion packs, uh, a dozen or so, that you can just add more content to the game. I would encourage people to check it out if you don't mind dice checking. I'd love to see like a Blade Runner style game when you're talking about this, like with a Voight comp test, but like not a super depressing hostage negotiation that ends with like Rutger Hour, but like an actual fun game. <laughs> like this, especially if you're doing a solo mission, which would be cool. Like uh, Inhuman Conditions, but for one player? No, obviously a game that doesn't already exist and I didn't already know about, and I'm not trying to cover it up, Rick. Thank you. You're very welcome, Keegan. Anyway, moving on. Can you guys tell in the audience that I'm not as used to this as these two? <laughs> <laughs> Any dang way. I don't want to cut you off, Pete. Is there any more you got to say about Hostage Negotiator? I think the only other thing I would say is that I wish it were more. And I know people are going to be like, okay, well, why is it on your top four list for solo games? And that's a fair question. If you want a cafe-based, kind of fun, dice-chucking pretzels game that you can just get in and get out of, Hostage Negotiator is, is there for you. And if you want to be more invested in it, by turning it into a campaign style thing, you can get Crime Wave and Career and do that. And then you can really become invested in your hostage negotiator as a character from scenario to scenario. I still want the Voight Contest one, but cool. Keegan, what about you? A lot of the games I'm going to talk about, you guys are going to see a little bit of an overarching theme. But the first one I want to start with is a game that is available on Etsy. The game is called 32% came out in 2020, so right in the, during the pandemic, designed in its entirety, actually, by Ella Lim. Belie I believe it's self-published. It's put out by Lost Ways, uh, Lost Ways Press, and Ella Lim's store is called Lost Ways. So I'm pretty sure it's a self-published thing. But it's found on Etsy. You can find them. It's great. And essentially, this is a journaling game about being stranded on a forgotten planet where you have seven days to either get rescued or die trying. This is another game that uses a game that uses a deck of cards to help set up the prompts, and then you've got the seven day period that you are futzing around on this planet with. Why? Why seven days? Oh yeah, duh. the main premise of the game is that you've crash landed on this planet, and so you have set you have seven days worth of food, water, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of a survival game, kind of not. Thirty two percent refers to the amount of power your crash ship has, roughly. Yeah, making it the title makes it a lot easier to remember that. Yeah, yeah, and it helps kind of set the set the mood that you're about to get into. Yeah. The pros of this game are, are for me, really, really basic. Um, I love to write. I mean, you guys, those of you who have been listening for a while have seen the ridiculousness that is all the weird, chaotic stuff I put all over our core and copy stuff. So I love to write. And I feel like grad school has taken a lot of that love away. And I think we, I think we can all talk about growing up in general, the love of writing disappears for a lot of us. In my case, it's due to the volume and how technical it has to be, whereas this is sure. a game that pushes me to write for fun. And I like quick journaling games in general, and this is one of the ones that I think really stands out. And it has just enough constraints so that you are kind of making art, which is kind of fun too. Nice. So yeah, um, the cons, well, <laughs> I guess the biggest con about this game, and this is gonna be kind of a recurring theme, art isn't always good. I know that's a really like bland way to put this, but I do find myself skipping days a lot with these games. So like I'm writing, so, so you know, you're, you're doing a journal entry every, every day, right? For seven days. That's sort of the, the way you can play this game. Um, that lets your entries be a little bit longer, a little bit more story. What's going on to you on this planet? This game is kind of fun because you can skip it down to seven draws and that's it. But sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad. Keegan, I'm over here. I'm kind of like, when you said no, art is not always good, I'm just kind of like nodding. I'm like, yeah, man, art isn't always good. But people on the podcast cannot see me nod. So when you say art isn't always good, like, what are you talking about? 
<laughs> I, I mean, I guess I don't think it's a particularly controversial <laughs> statement, but we live in a world where, like, this is gonna be me on my soapbox. Uh-oh. Um, for those <laughs> of you at home who also are, aren't realizing that, I wrote this into the script because I needed to say it. We live in a world where Andy Warhol exists, so obviously art isn't always good. <laughs> I do a mic drop here, but my microphone's really expensive. Uh, I should have edited the script. <laughs> All right. They can't see us anyway, Keegan. You can just add the noise in post. I suppose I could. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, to your question, Pete, like there really isn't a, I don't mean much by it other than like, you know, art is subjective and that's great, but it also, just because it's subjective does not mean it's without its faults. And so. And sometimes it feels like more work than it's bringing you joy. Yeah, exactly. So I like writing games. This is a nice game for that because it can be so much shorter. So personal note, I like LLM's games in general. She actually has a new one called The Lighthouse at the Edge of the Universe. And when I got 32%, she actually sent me a uh, super mini RPG called Monolith, which is pretty cool. It exists on a business card. The way that she's doing things I think is brilliant. She's doing these short solo games using zines and business cards, like from Monolith. So this was, a for those of you who are not my age, and if you are, drink your water, take your meds, and your back hurts, and I'm sorry. In the old days, art used to be put around by zines, like little self-produced books and stuff. And so this is kind of cool seeing zine and, and card-based way of distributing games. And again, using Etsy was really cool. So there's just a lot of good things, I think, about the way Elle is going about everything. I mean, that makes her an innovator, progenitor. Yeah. Or it could be that she's first is worst, you know what I mean? I mean, did, is, is this really, did, did this really give you what you want out of journaling games? What, and like, what more would you like to see out of journaling games? Was this it for you? I mean, it gave me a lot. I think that, and this will come up later, um, it's my number four for this reason. I love journaling games. This gave me a really, this scratched a really important itch. This is a generally positive, quick review of the game. The thing to note, I guess for me, is that I do like a little bit more meat, and I think what holds this game back is that like you can make it longer, you can make it shorter, there's a lot going in. You, as the player, are the one who is adding a lot of this content, which I think is really good, and in, in LLM's case, I think that that's like a, a good artistic choice. I have seen games use this as kind of, I, I, don't, I don't want to say laziness, because I know what goes into creating a game, but mm -hmm. th that's what I worry about. So I like that she did this, I am worried about future versions. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. So if you guys are making your own small games, like put some effort into it. Gosh darn it. All right, Rick, what's your number three? So my number three is Triplock by Chip Theory Games. This is a game where you carefully manipulate locks in a steampunk London, learning their secrets and avoiding their traps. Quick hello to both the people who remember the Dishonored and Thief games. This one's for you. <laughs> Steampunk lockpicking is right up my alley, and these components are very satisfying to play and fiddle with. They're high quality, they're weighty, and the artwork on it is very nice, and it keeps you in the theme. Now, the instructions for this one do benefit from a second or third read-through, first few times I tried to play this, I was a bit lost. But when I finally figured out what I was supposed to be doing, I thought, oh, OK, I actually have some levers to work with here and I actually have a chance to win. If you can get through that, the core puzzle is captivating and there's a lot of fun flavor in here. There's flavor for the characters, there's flavor for the missions and there's flavor for the city itself. It's also got three extra episodes that you can purchase for about ten dollars a piece and they form a continuing story which lets you uncover the motives of your mysterious benefactor, the stranger, a masked woman in a sort of clockwork mask. I like how this game allows you to overcome randomness with a cost. Each turn you get two actions that are randomly determined, and if you don't want to perform either of those actions, you can sort of meld them together into any action you do want. So good luck is prize and it's very important, but you don't feel useless if it's not with you. Triplock is pretty fun because you can play it in about 15 minute sessions once you've gotten the hang of it. You do see some of this game as a single player, which is clearly, it's almost like exposed wires. It's all of these opportunities that you get to mess with the other player, but the other player isn't there. 
So the good thing about that is if you have Triplock on your shelf and you brought it for a solo game, you have even more to explore once you're playing it with two. So it's going to be good to have it on your shelf. It's going to pull its weight for you. So Rick, Triplock is by Chip Theory Games, right? And it's one of their earlier games. And you know, Chip Theory Games since then has done Hoplomachus and Too Many Bones and Cloud Spire. And I think they're their fans are waiting on the release of Burn Cycle in 2022. You know, mm-hmm. hugely elaborate games that have, you know, beautiful neoprene mats and vinyl rule books and weighted poker chip game components and things like this. And so Triplock being one of their first games, and you've seen kind of where the company has gone, do you think Triplock as a game that's been out for a few years still kind of like holds its uh, its weight and kind of within the context of all the huge things that Chip Theory Games have done since then? Do you think it still stands up? Yeah, I think it, I think it holds up. I definitely say that Chip Theory Games has moved on from Triplock. For some people, that's really going to be a great thing. For others, you know, the simpler game might actually be more fun. You know, your mileage may vary. For me, this this feels like a really solid start. It's got the foundations of their company, which is, you know, quality components, the weighted chips, all of this stuff that is very satisfying to interact with. You know, I think they, they learned a, a good bit about the instructions and how to streamline them as time goes on. but I mean, so. I've never thought Chip Theory Games instruction manuals are streamlined, but I mean, if you can make your way through them while, you know, sitting in the bath or wherever you read your game manuals, more power to you. It definitely takes me a few read-throughs. <laughs> I, I do have one quick question because something that just occurred to me, and, and maybe you mentioned it, Rick, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking through. What about replayability? When I think of these games, that's one of my first worries about solo games in general, but games like Triplock, and I'm just wondering, just from your experience, thoughts? I mean, you know, 15-minute session sounds great, but if you can only play the game five times, then is that really worth it? Sure. Triplock is one of their less expensive games. I think the base game is around 27 bucks, something like that. I played through the first mission, you know, four or five times before I was able to get through it, and it contained, you know, five or six missions in the pack. You can also switch up your character to change sort of the angle from which you're approaching these problems. Again, one of the problems with the single player campaign is a lot of the characters have abilities that interact well with another player, but don't really do anything when you're by yourself. So yeah, there's some replayability there. You are going to run out of it eventually, absolutely. Yeah, for $27, though, that's not terrible. Yeah. I do think that $27 to check out the high-quality components of this company, Chip Theory Games, I mean, that's reasonable, right? And that's good because while their Hoplomachus games will tell for, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, most of their modern games uh, or more recent games retail for well over $100. <laughs> Too Many Bones is, I think, 130 MSRP and Cloud Spire is maybe 150 or close to it. And so it's not a cheap company to get in with in terms of their products, but Trip Lock is, is quite manageable. So, Rick, as a locksmith, Trip Lock, go. As a locksmith, most of my locks don't actually fight back. <laughs> And it would be cooler if they did. I mean, would it? You do notice, if you know how to pick a lock, that there are a lot of characters going at these locks with a whole bunch of picks in their hands and no tension rinses. So this is probably not a game designed by a locksmith. And I can't say it's particularly similar to picking a lock, but, you know, for me, the, the aesthetic carries it. Okay. All right. It's probably better not to teach people how to pick locks. See, I mean, you say that. <laughs> but actually, if you don't teach people how to pick locks, then people buy cheap locks not knowing how easy they are to pick. That's fair. And the taboo about talking about locks in general leaves the door open for a lot of companies to sell very cheap products. And we are getting off base. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to know. I mean, locks don't really keep anyone out, right? There are just legal issues if you do. I don't know. If you vi- if you violate them. I mean, it's it's true. If someone really wants to get into your house, they will break a window or break your door. Rick, this is a family show. You're scaring the children. <laughs> okay. I understand that. That said, what we're saying people is be afraid. Make sure your make sure your front door is lit because that might be more of a 
more of a benefit than having a better lock on the door. So this is kind of a perfect transition because my number three game is actually This War of Mine by Awaken Realms. Oh yeah, lots of lock picking in that one. It's also a laugh riot. Yeah, 2017 Awaken Realms. This War of Mine, the board game, you know, the tabletop adaptation of the award-winning uh, game, where you have a bunch of civilians trapped in a war-torn city. Locks optional. So there are kind of two cycles in this game, a day cycle and a night cycle. And during the day, you'll take shelter in a ruined tenement house. You will remove rubble. You'll search through various rooms, often behind barricaded doors. You're going to build beds, stoves, get tools, get water, get filters, trap small animals. You're going to kind of cultivate an impromptu vegetable garden. You're going to reinforce security in various ways. And should winter come, you'll try and keep warm. And during the night phase, your main duties will be consist of guarding your shelter with what very few possessions you have accumulated against bandits and raiders. <laughs> That's the game. Oof, man. <sighs> I really do, I loved the video game of this before it became so prescient. This game makes me physically and psychologically ill these days. Not to just have a moment with Pete's game, but it's a Polish developer on the original game, and with current events, it's like this beautiful and incredibly rough situation. I'm glad you brought it up, but it's like, it's, you know, under my skin currently. Yeah, that's, to that's fair. That's absolutely fair. Well, and that's, in a sense, part of the game. Is it supposed to get under your skin? Oh, yeah. It's supposed to be real as opposed to power fantasy. Yeah. I do. Want, I wanted to mention it just for people who might pick it up from this, this podcast. Like, given current events... 100%. Just keep that in mind. This game was put together by people with a war in Eastern Europe as, like, the backdrop. So I've, I've got just, just a thing to mention. Again, brilliant, beautiful game. Nothing but good things to say about it. And with that in mind, you know, it has this incredible survival theme. You know, when you're crafting and when you're scavenging, every piece of material matters. Yeah. So if you find a pot, you know, like finding a pot to boil water in is you're just euphoric that you found this. And you think about where that game set its bar. Finding a pot to boil water in is a euphoric experience. Keegan, to your point, the game is emotionally draining. It's, it's not a game about building anything. It's a game about surviving and surviving alone. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Bringing anything back is a distant, distant thought. Yes. You're trying to get to tomorrow. The, the game does have a couple of expansions. So in This War of Mine, Tales from the Ruined City, you can explore sewers, you can buy from farmers and do some other cool stuff. In This War of Mine, Days of the Siege, which came out in 2020, that has a full-length campaign. But, you know, as you're just trying to survive in this game, it's, you know, it's that base level of the Maslowian hierarchy. And just speaking about my own privilege, when I've had an emotionally difficult day, I want to come back home and bury my face in my cat. I would not play this game after an emotionally difficult day. And maybe I should, in a way. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I stopped playing the video game altogether at the beginning of the pandemic, actually. Just thinking about your story. Because it just got to be too much. Yeah, and I was a huge fan. The Child's War expansion had just come out, which, I mean, come on. So I feel you, Pete. I was actually playing a campaign game of this recently by myself, but my my cat uh, of 12 years uh, passed away recently, and after burying him, I came back to my game. I'm like, I, I can't, I can't, I can't play this game right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Pete. Oh, thanks. Um, Sometimes it's best to fight one war at a time. Yeah. One war at a time, man. But I will say, though, that I have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of memories of this cat of mine, Spaz, who's actually been featured on the Corex and Coffee website at least once, if not multiple times. But one of my favorite memories of Spaz is from a few years ago when I was doing a lot of Magic the Gathering. And I'd be out um, on my dining room table and I'd have all of my cards laid out. And I'm trying to assemble this deck and then I'd go up and go to the kitchen to make it, you know, a, a tea or coffee or whatever. And I'd come back three months later and Spaz would be sprawled out all over the table all of my cards would have kicked some of them to the floor, had gotten fur in some of the card protecting pouches. I mean, and it was all I could do was scoop them up and put my face in his fur and take pictures of him and just love on him. Um, just my, my best friend, you know, which is really bad parenting, I know, after he's like knocked everything to the floor. I'd be like, oh, you're the best cat ever. But uh, I think he might have been a planeswalker, to be honest, my cat's bass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
But I have played this war of mine, getting back to that, in better emotional times of my own. When I can kind of emotionally afford to have that escapism, and again, that's absolutely my privilege speaking. But it's a really interesting experience in game form to face the task of surviving the day, only to face the task of sur surviving the night, only to face the day again, and then the night, and then the day, and then the night, and then the day, and then the night, and then the day, and then the night, over and over and over again, simply for the task of survival. Okay, but do you have to do anything during the day, is my main question here. Oh, you're, you're gathering and crafting a lot of items during the day. <laughs> what are you saying to me? I was going with the day and night thing. I'm just being a pill. Oh, uh, <laughs> wouldn't have any any other way, sir. I mean, I I hope you as the listeners don't have to forge in like a OCP cybernetically augmented zombie dance party fulfilled by Cyberdyne systems hosted by Vladimir Putin. That's really what this game is. I mean, it's a thing. Google it. But first, before you Google the Cyberdyne thing, Google seriously. Google the lunchbox fiasco of 2018. The Lunchbox Fiasco of 2018, that will give you some context. Especially for that cybernetically augmented zombie bit. Yeah, no, they're related. Go check it out and then come back and listen. Yeah. So one great thing I love about this game is that it really brings the humanity to the fore. And that's one of the best, most interesting parts about the post-apocalypse or any sort of survival situation. What do you keep of your morals even when you can't afford them? What a question. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, Nietzsche would say, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, we're not going there. So Kierkegaard would say, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, sorry, I didn't mean to get too deep on the game about war and surviving horrible things. Again, there's a children's expansion, guys. Like, let's not. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's realistic. So. The current political situation, a.k.a. war, a.k.a. crimes against humanity situation going on in Eastern Europe right now. And keep in mind, we're not out of SARS-CoV-2 at all either. You don't say. I do say, actually. Yes, I do say. <laughs> Go check your CD web C CDC websites, people. Also, maybe get vaccinated. Can we still say that when we're curating content like this? I don't know. I'm, I'm okay taking a hard stance on the please get vaccinated thing. For those of you who don't know, I do a lot of work in neuropsych in a hospital, and I can't say which ones, but I will tell you right now, please get your vaccines. That's all I'll say. So this war of mine, yeah, I like to play it a little bit at the time. When I, when I play it by myself, I leave it out on my living room table. But then friends will come over, and they'll see this thing taking over half of my apartment, and they'll look at it and they'll go, oh, what is that? What, what's going on? They all know I'm a gamer. So then I will explain it to them, and then when there are some games on my table, friends will come over and, you know, kind of give it a side glance or whatever. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's Pete playing a game. Or they'll go over to it, and I'll explain it, and I'll explain it to them, and they'll go, okay, cool. Now let's go to a bar or whatever we're doing, right? But multiple times when I've had out this war of mine, people will look at it. I'll have I'll explain it to them. They'll kind of furrow their brows, and then they'll kind of like slowly like slide into the chair that I have at the table, and they'll start moving things around. And at that point, I know I've got them because then I say, "Oh, let's play around together," you know. And they say, "Oh, how, how can we do that?" I'm like, "No, no, we can totally play this together. No problem." And we'll play a round or two together, and then they might say, okay, let's go do whatever we're going to do. But then they'll leave at the end of the night, and I'll play the game throughout the week, and they'll text me and say, are we still alive? <laughs> or, they'll, or they'll come back over, and they'll say, is this the same game? Is this?" And they'll say, they won't say you, they'll say we, because, oh, they're invested now, right? They put their hands on the pieces, and they realize it was all about survival. I'm like, and I'll have to either say, yes, we're still alive. And they go, oh, what have you been doing? Or I'll say, oh, no, we died. This is a new game. This is something that ropes people in, this, this you know, base level of survival. <laughs> That's how you get them. Thematically, it's very compelling. Back to, you know, guys want to date ourselves. Reminds me of Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. Like that story you just said of like, oh, these are all my friends and these are people. and But like, obviously more compelling. Just that, that's funny to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, Keegan, what's your number three? My games are really in no particular order, but I'm going to pretend that this is the number three game. This one's called Into the Dungeon. Good job. They'll never know. We well, can't see our scripts. But legitimately, a game I really enjoyed, an incredible solo game called Into the Dungeon, also out in 2020. This one was designed by Harry Connor, and they do a bunch of the art in the game, as well as additional art by Felix Mail. If I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, I'm sorry, Felix. 
um, Faye Stacy and Letty Wilson. This was published by Andrews McMeal Publishing. You may not know the publisher, but you know the publisher. They publish a lot of different books. And this is a choose your own adventure book. And you guys remember the choose your own adventure books? Oh, yes. Mm hmm. I love them. Choose Your Own Adventure has always been my, well, it was actually one of my favorite ways to get into gaming and still look like I was reading a book. And so I didn't get in trouble in school. Oh, that's clever. I mean, I used to have a bookshelf full of them. And I think when I started dating, I was like, oh, I can't have these anymore. And <laughs> I, I got rid of them. And now I'm like, oh, no, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> what did I do? You're just dating the wrong people. Agreed. Oh, man. We should do like a confession or something. <laughs> A gamer confession. Oh, wow. Uh, anyway, uh, not to catch you off, Pete. <laughs> um, so at, at, at one point back in the day, my brother, who we'll have uh, as a guest on the podcast at some point, actually had 30 or 40 Choose Your Own Adventure books. Oh, wow. And I think I think I did make fun of him for him because I was a bad older brother 25 years ago. But every <laughs> once in a while, I would sneak into his room and, and grab some and read them and think they were awesome. And then, you know, like I said, I think I threw some of them away because puberty. I should he <laughs> I probably owe him some as a present. I feel bad now. Let's move on. <laughs> Maybe bringing him on this podcast should just be your confession of that. And apology, <laughs> a whole, Pete. A whole episode of Pete just being like, "Here's all the bad things I did to you." How is this <laughs> board gaming? Okay, different podcast. Maybe we'll, let, we'll do that next year. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, into the dungeon was the, what I was talking about. So this is a combination of a rules light tabletop RPG where you pick characters that have certain stats, and those stats actually help you make decisions about which path to take. So in a Choose Your Own Adventure book, typically you've got like, go to page 14 to fight the monster. Go to page 12 to open the door. In this, you may have one or even two extra things like if you have a dex of three, you can dodge the monster. If you have a constitution of nine, you can take the hit. That kind of stuff. Which is really a cool way to do it because like it, it builds into the replayability, which I really like. Hmm. And different characters legitimately have different adventures, which is kind of cool. And I do love that mix of systems where you can make the right choice, but it's not the right choice for you because your con sucks. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. You know. What's especially cool about it is decisions that you make can also affect your stats. So to your point, like you could have made a mistake four or five choices ago that, well, you did have three decks, but now you don't have it. <laughs> So right. it's just kind of a cool concept. I don't. I really dig it. And honestly, there's a lot of pros about this game. Like like all choose your own adventure books, it can be played quickly, or it can take a long time depending on your character and path. You don't need anything with you. There's no you. You can have a pencil and stuff for noting things down. But honestly, you could use your phone, your phone's note app, or you can just do it by memory and honor system, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice. Um, so you can play it in the car, which is one thing I liked about when I was a kid doing road trips. Choose Your Own Adventure got me through a lot of that. The replayability is great. As long as you play as intended, I do have to say, like, blew past it, but I want to point out the honor system thing. It can be really tempting to jump around and, and like, you know, maybe lie and hold a couple pages and go, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> bookmark a couple spots. Yeah, I would I would never do that. No, and it, it this is a game in particular that I think would really be hurt from it. It's not a particularly long book. And so there's a lot of beauty in playing it as it's meant to be played. So I hate it when people do that. I just want to quickly say that because the pro is huge if you play it the way it was intended. A really neat thing, too, this is just, it's more personal, but it's just something I think about a lot. Pete, you kind of mentioned back with Hostage Negotiator about diversity representation. Yeah. Well, Harry is particularly cool. They're known for their art being this sort of mixture of gender presentations, mixture of racial and ethnic presentations, a lot of non-binary stuff, a lot of... It, that way, sort of anyone can put themselves on the game. They're also really well known for their art of the Together Studios Adventure Zone. Great comic if you guys haven't read it, but it's a big LGBTQ comic. And on top of that, Harry's been brought on to do the, the art for the Adventure Zone game, the Bureau of Balance, which is oh kind of okay, neat. yeah, so really cool stuff. Nice. I haven't played it yet, but I like Together Studios, so I think they're going to be. I think it'll be nice. fun. But it can't all be rainbows and sunshine. The cons really won't be surprising to anyone who has played, read, played. I don't know what word to use here, but has has experienced a choose your own adventure style game. 
you do run out of content eventually. As I mentioned, it is a little short. So this game has a lot of branching paths. You do find yourself treading over some of the same. It has the intro problem where you kind of like the first five or six choices are always kind of the same. It, 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 right. It's like a, like a training kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, so as you replay, it, it comes up. So I'd rec- I just want people to know that and be wary of it. To the point, I think the thing else to say about it is like I'm always looking for non-traditional games. A lot of the games I'm going to talk about today are either from people who are very high like allies or people who are non-traditional game designers. Gaming is largely still white and male, which is fair. That's still the way it is. And so I just want to kind of point out I like seeing games created by people like Harry. It allows people to p- put themselves in the game in a way that you don't always get to. I don't look like Nathan Drake. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, no, yeah. Um, yeah. And not that there isn't representative stuff, but like in the top tier of gaming, it's not as commonplace. And I really do think that as Harry builds games, they're going to see themselves in that top tier because this really was really well done for such a small project. So obviously, if you like Choose Your Own Adventures, if you liked Four Against the Darkness, we mentioned earlier, this game's a little less complex, but it's cool. So hopefully, they get the attention and support they need to get up into that higher tier. 100%, yeah. All right, Rick, what is your number two? So my number two, I'm actually going to lump together two very similar games. You would. Romeo and or Juliet and To Be or Not To Be, both by Ryan North. See, I didn't know that Keegan was going to talk about the choose your own adventure things. So I was going to go <laughs> off about how solo games are fundamentally different from ones you play with other people, that you don't actually need cards or a board or physical objects to serve as a language between players because you're already on your own page. <laughs> you know, no, you're a single player. Funny? Was that supposed to be funny, Rick? I-, I was expecting a groan, but, you know, I'll take a laugh. <laughs> So one of the oldest and most prolific genre of single-player games is actually the Choosable Adventure book. I've got two examples which aren't written for kids eight and up. Just a quick pause here. If anyone's listening, I will give my left arm and maybe someone else's left arm for a set of the Goosebumps branded Choose Your Own Adventure books. I assume R.L. Stein listens to our podcast and is fond of collecting arms. I mean, he must. He has great taste. Or just so our listeners are informed consumers... I have known Keegan for a long time, and every two or three months he will say, Pete, I will give you my left arm if you do this, and I'm an idiot, so I always do it. And then he gives me some weird thing. Well, I mean, like, as long as I I will give you a left arm. I'm very good at specifying (laughs) a left arm. It won't be his. For legal reasons, this is all a joke. I'm sure R.L. Stein actually collects fingers, not arms. It's a, we're fine, we're fine. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They, they are more compact. Anyway, Romeo, Allentor, Juliet, and To Be or Not To Be are a pair of books written by Ryan North, and they use the titular plays as a jumping-off point. There are, in fact, signposts by the correct choices, which will allow you to experience the classic plays as they originally were performed, in case your Shakespearean education isn't up to snuff. You're going to run into a lot of extra humor on the way, of course, but you also get to branch off from the play, and you can branch off pretty significantly. You can play things from the other characters' perspectives. You can fight in robotic mechs. You can end the story very quickly and very sensibly, or you can find yourself in a even worse, terrible ending than the play ends up in. For two of the biggest tragedies, that's saying a lot. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it gets worse. Like the Choose Your Own Adventure books many of us remember, these books have decent replay value. Part of the fun is finding every crazy choice and grisly end available to you. They'll run you 20 bucks a piece. They're evil, easy to store. They're eminently regiftable, and that's a feature that's handy for many solo games. They're full of funny pictures, modern humor, and sudden endings. I'm going to disagree with Keegan here and say you should keep those fingers in your old places because sometimes in these particular games, you just make a funny choice and then you're immediately dead. So, you know, <laughs> why not go make the other one? Yeah, that's fair. I, I mean, I love Ryan North. He's been one of my favorite, like, favorites ever since he did dinosaur comics back in the day. So I'll give you that. I'd really love to see what he would do with a more traditional RPG 
or more board games. Like, especially with something like Starcrossed being right up its alley. See, folks, my comments can be helpful. I am an agent of chaos, but I do contain multitudes. Even the slot is helpful once a day? <laughs> Even a broken clock doesn't mention horror twice a day. Speaking of horror, I'm actually going to mention my number two now, which is horror-themed, which is Arkham Horror the Card Game, which came out in 2016 by Fantasy Flight Games, and it is still supported six years later. So it's a living card game, which is, you know, it's not customizable, but, you know, it has a number of expansions, but in each expansion, they're guaranteed the same card set. So it's not a true customizable card game. It's a living card game, or if it's a generic, it's an iterative card game. In Arkham Horror the Card Game, you become a character within the fictional Massachusetts town of Arkham, created by H.P. Lovecraft. And, you know, interestingly, I'm sure many people already know this, but just to make that connection, Arkham Asylum from DC Comics is named after H.P. Lovecraft's fictional Arkham, Massachusetts. Fun fact. So in Arkham Horror the Card Game, you're working with a deck of cards, you're trying to solve mysteries and gain knowledge without becoming insane or dying. Classic themes in Lovecraftian mythology and narrative. Right. You want to learn enough to know what to do and not too much. Too much to know what's actually going on because if you do, you're gonna, you'll go, quote, crazy, unquote. Exactly. Arkham Horror is not a one-off game. You can play it that way, but it's designed to be a campaign with your deck of cards constantly being updated and expanded to become more powerful and growing from scenario to scenario. Does it fill up with madness? So you're, you, can, you can get additional madness throughout the game, but there are also ways to take that madness out and things like that. And you can kind of play it your own way. There are kind of very clear ways of cheating and things that are more gray gray area, depending on what you want out of your game. There's a lot of flexibility, which is really nice. So what else can I say about Arkham Horror, the card game? You know, I have a few choice words, but I'll probably save those because I'm going to have to edit them out later. Uh, Never uh, mind. All right. Um, I kid. I do love this game, but talk about madness, boy. Really. <laughs> The game is, like, just, just looking at the components, they are so, so, so very pretty. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you look at the purples and the blues and the greens and the yellows, and these are, like, the true platonic forms of the colors. I mean, I just look at the purples, I'm like, that is what an eggplant purple is supposed to be. It's just, oh, it's perfect. This one was researched. Yeah, I can say what I want about, about like, my experiences with Arkham and my experience specifically with Call of Cthulhu, the larger version of this, and Elder Sign. But you, the art direction at, at Fantasy Flight is just top tier. It, it is. I, it absolutely is top tier. And whether the cards be top tier in terms of design and artwork, which I love, or less so, you both know, and our listeners probably know by now, that I love decks of cards. I love expandable, customizable, iterative card games. You both know I've been in the, the, the gaming space and the hobby for 30 plus years. I have enough 63 by 88 millimeter cardboard in my house to stone somebody to death. Death by a thousand paper cuts? Uh, seriously, as awful a thought as that is, a much better use of that court cardboard to be to play the games they are created for, for the most part. I've got plenty of customizable card games that promised more than they delivered, but Arkham Horror is not one of them. Arkham Horror fits into category of games that promises and over delivers. And just so visually pleasing to look at. I've actually played this game at my kitchen table at 2 a.m. in candlelight with a glass full of wine in my steampunk top hat and glasses. Not because the game needed any of that, just because I wanted to immerse myself in the game that much. Um, I just It's something I did for me. <laughs> you know, just real quick, I know I have nothing to do with it, but I always like to take a little bit of credit for people being introduced to this deeply weird genre of like steampunk, 1890s to 1920s Massachusetts with Eldritch Horror. And I'm just, it just warms my heart to hear that you're doing all these things. <laughs> my cold black heart. <laughs> Uh, Keegan, I, you, you know what's, you know, you and I lived in the same space for a number of years, and now we live in different parts of the country, unfortunately. And I think one of my biggest regrets is while we were living in the same place, we never actually played Arkham Horror together. 
I know, I know. And but also same for Call of Cthulhu and same for Elder Sign, right? right? Yeah, These yeah. um well, uh, different yeah. companies, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we're doing this for a while where you and I were in the same part of the country and Rick was on the other coast and now I moved and now Rick and I are in the same part of the country and you're on the other coast. So I'll come visit one day. Yeah, yeah. Um we play plenty of games socially distanced, so that's fine. Um, exactly. One of the cons about Arkham Horror is that because it's designed to be a campaign game that can turn people off, like, oh, I just want a one-off. And you can play Arkham Horror as a one-off, even though it's designed to be kind of this iterative campaign. But you can play it as a one-off and people can have a really good time. So it's not really a con, it's just something for people to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keegan, what's your number two? My number two game is actually the game I'm playing currently, so it's kind of fun to talk about. This is another one from 2020. I don't know why I keep qualifying that. You're all listening. You can all look it up. Something happened in 2020. It was weird. It's still <laughs> happening. Uh, so anyway, this game is called The Machine. Now, this game was designed by Adria Slatterly and Fen Slatterly. I actually looked it up. I'm not sure if they're siblings or, or together... If it's a weird coincidence, I don't know how common Slatterly is as a last name, but they put this game out, self-published, and I'm going to do my best to express why this game is wonderful. It's my number two, but it can be, it'll be probably be a number one game of mine for a long time. So this game is about obsession and infernal demonic machines. Yep, that's, that's Keegan's meat and mead for sure. Yeah, this is yeah. great. We're talking about this right after a Lovecraftian game because you don't get... Yeah, that, that checks out. You don't get much more Lovecraftian than this. I mean, like, in a lot of ways, it's an RPG that makes me think of, like, being a character in a Hellraiser film. It, basically, you are playing somebody who gets this, this light music in the back of your mind that you can't shake. And this, this spirit that you can't really explain, this madness is building up inside of you, forcing you to construct a machine... You're, you're writing another journaling game. So this is kind of Pete to answer your question from way back when. This gave me what I wanted. It's a journaling game that takes place over real time. They recommend that you do one or two entries a week and then leave it alone for three or four days and come back to it. Draw from a deck of cards to give you this, to give you your prompts to help you write what's going on. And it, if, basically, the game is designed so that at some point you will end you will die you will go crazy you'll do something without finishing your without finishing your machine you cannot finish the machine despite your obsession and so then you have this journal and what the game suggests you do is sends this send this journal dead drop style to someone with the rules in the beginning of it and say you know your turn and it becomes this like house of leaves style game where you're then picking up on building the machine the other person couldn't finish and then you are going insane and you're living your life. There's some prompts for what kind of character you have as well. Holy crap. It's just this really like dark journal passing thing. And eventually you're, you're basically writing a horror novel together. And you can eventually, they, they suggest you bring it back to the first person and share your stories together. So what, um, is, to st what is to stop someone yeah. from writing something stupid or goofy or just off brand that will all the other players just want to make sure that the characters... You know, like what happens if players just make sure one of the make sure one of the other characters ends up in a wagon cart full of severed heads or something completely ridiculous or doesn't wake up at all? How do you handle that? I mean, kind of nothing. There's there's sort of two answers to that. There are prompts and RP like there are prompts and character sort of motivations and things that you draw from when you're building your character. And I don't know that something stupid or goofy would be problematic, right? Like, the game is really supposed to be dark and spooky, but the whole idea is that even if it's silly and goofy, or you wake up in a cart full of severed heads or whatever, when you're passing it on, you don't get to decide what the next player is doing. So if you end up in a cart full of severed heads, mm -hmm. the next player finds this journal where someone fell and died in a cart full of severed heads. And so... Um, I kind of like that about this, that you could make it goofy and there could be a couple goofy chapters and that would be fine. So you're also talking about madness, right? So yeah. it's the very definition of unreliable narrator. Exactly. I think it would be really funny to write a, a whole section of this. One side of the journal is like the cutesy, like, oh, today we went to the store. And on the other side, it's like you're Alice in Wonderland screaming in, a, in an asylum somewhere. And like... 
a, a true epistolary fashion. So to your point, Pete, I think it would be cool because then I would want to write the other side of what's really happening. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mm-hmm. Rick. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no worries. And it also gets to the point where you could probably spend a, a decent amount of time just trying to investigate what you're already building. Yeah. Not so much adding stuff yourself, but like, hey, so this thing doesn't seem to be doing what it's supposed to be doing, but I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, and that's, that's one of the beauties of games like this. I mean, especially for like a $5 PDF, this game is like choice because you can do a lot. You, we're already, the three of us, building on what we could be doing in this game. That's what I, one of the things I love about it. Uh-huh. This conversation would be a conversation you can have with the other people you're playing with. To that end, I do want to point out that a rule in this game that I really like, they recommended doing an out-of-character sheet in the beginning. Um, uh, Rick, you kind of talked a little bit about this in your LARPing thing, so this is kind of a LARP in this way. Uh, out-of-character trigger warning sheet that play, that players are supposed to fill out to be like, you know, I'm a horror fan. We can get a little dark. We do, like, you know, I have seen all of the Saw movies. <laughs> I can tell you the deep the deep background story, if you'd like, of the Saw films. So, so that means that, like, I could write something that could be pretty gory. Um, and th- what I like about it is that this trigger warning thing helps it stay a little bit lighter if you need to, or for like, if people want to avoid that stuff, they can. And then the silly and goofy person would also be expected to be like, you know, to write a little blurb like, hey, this gets kind of silly at this point, or maybe sure. skip this section, I'll reference it enough. And so there is a little bit of like hand-holding among the play group. It's like an RPG being done asynchronously, if that makes sense, and over months. And I, I think that's important because yeah. games and stories are real. They can do real things for us. And that also means they have the potential to cause real harm. So being a little bit careful about them and, you know, again, talking about your safety expectations, talking about your table rules, etc. You know, yeah, you can invite somebody over to play your games, but if they don't follow your table rules and, you know, feed your pet something they're allergic to, that has a real cost. So it's important to talk about these things. Especially, I think, because we're talking about solo games, right? And so this is a game that the expectation is that you're not playing among other people. When I'm done with my journal piece, I will have not been interacting with anybody I had played with. That's the way I'm choosing to play it. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, those trigger warnings are so important because you're not going to have people to decompress with afterwards, which I think is kind of your point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You know, (laughs) I got to be honest with both of you. I had a really hard time coming up with cons for me personally. And I want to acknowledge that this is basically a bunch of writing prompts and the game can get dark as hell. And so like, this isn't going to work for everyone as it's built. And for me, it's beautiful. So the con here is mostly read that trigger warning thing. And also for people who are passing the game on, consider the people who you're passing the game on to. You can only think about one, you know, one degree of separation, but think about that degree of separation, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe warn them before you send this in the in the mail. Yeah, exactly. And I don't want to jelly anybody's jam, but <laughs> that's what I want to be careful with. As a fan of horror, the pickings are slim for really good horror, especially in the solo space. So that's also part of my con, wanting to avoid cons, is like lots of games utilize darkness. But they don't really get into existential nightmares like this game does, like the machine does, which is where my bread and butter sits. I mean, Pete, you you talked about Lovecraft earlier. We've also talked about your reading Lovecraft. I've loved Lovecraft for a long time. Yeah. And this is a game, in fact, this game makes me think about a book called Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke by Eric LaRocca from last year. I believe it's LaRocca, not LaRocca. Eric, if you're listening, I'm sorry if I got that wrong. In that this game is not for everyone, but it scratches an itch that was needed for some of us. Quick sidebar, if you read, things have gotten worse since we last spoke. Just be aware that there aren't enough trigger warnings in the world. It is an incredibly beautiful and dark book, but be very careful with it. <laughs> so does it scratch that itch for you, Keegan? Is this, is this, does it hit where it's needed? 110%. If you're a fan of like a thousand-year-old vampire, you might like this game. And I say that because a thousand-year-old vampire also scratched this itch. And so like... It's big. It's an undertaking. Uh, in a lot of ways, it feels like I'm starting an art project. But, you know, one that's on my own time and one that's a little bit shorter. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited. And I, I don't know who I'm... Maybe I'll send it to one of you, too. We'll see how it goes. So, I've talked about Thousand-Year-Old Vampire on this podcast before. And, Rick, you and I were actually just at a game store a couple of weeks ago together. And just, you know, 
because yes. we hadn't hung out and been in a brick and mortar game store out in public together in a while because of COVID. And so we were hanging out there seeing what was what. And the first thing that you reached for and did not let go of until you had paid for it and tossed it down in your car was a copy of Thousand Year Old Vampire. Yeah, Thousand Year Old Vampire. Just I love the aesthetic of the book. You know, it has stamps from libraries and private collections and all this sort of thing of, oh, this has been passed down through the years. It's It's been everywhere. If you get a, a chance to read this book, to, to play this game, read even the normally boring bits, you know, the forwards, the the copyright sort of things, because it still always is talking about the relentless march of time and how it wears away everything. Yeah, and Keegan, what you're saying is if you've picked up a copy of Thousand Year Old Vampire, pick up the machine and vice versa. Yeah, and the machine, by the way, is, I think it's like five bucks and it's printed on like a pamphlet style. So this is back to like my underground zine thing. So check it out, it's really cool. All right, Rick, what do you got for us? So my number one game is actually Box One by Neil Patrick Harris. Hang on. Didn't Neil Patrick Harris come up with a game called Amazed or something like that a few years ago that had like a score of like four on Board Game Geek or something ridiculous? Like, come on, man. Yeah, uh, please please tell me this is better than Amazed because like I love riddles, but like basically... Amazed, just for you at home who may not have played it, it's effectively the 300 best riddles or puzzles to read on the potty book, but in game form. Mm-hmm. So, like, I really hope, not to stop you here, Rick, but... And, like, like make no mistake, Neil Patrick Harris, I love you, I think you're amazing, you're incredibly talented, I kind of want to be you. But yeah. Amazed was terrible, so this better be better, Rick, go. Since we've jumped on Amazed, let me talk about Amazed okay. a little bit. <laughs> Amazed is a team game which is a bit like Trivial Pursuit in that you're moving around the board and you're trying to deal with challenge cards. In Amazed, those challenges are puzzles instead of trivia questions. You've got cryptography, you've got images, and you have to get some sort of a meaning out of them. And when you have completed enough of the puzzles, you get to the end of your journey and you beat the other team. The real problem with Amazed is there's no reason to do any of the puzzles. Which seems like a pretty big oversight, considering it's a board game. Yeah. First of all, there's very little replayability because you run out of them quickly. And there's also just no stakes at all. It's, oh, here's something that you could do. All of these things are mildly interesting. But again, it's complete 250 crosswords and somebody wins. Okay. But you're not talking about a maze. You're talking about... I, I, I want, I, I'm not I, I want talking, to say talking about, about Square One, but that's like a 1980s TV show about teaching kids how to do math or something. What, what's the name of this game? I'm talking about Box One by Neil Patrick Harris, who has learned his lesson. This game, frankly, it, it's the bane of game reviewers. We can't unbox this for you. We can't discuss the mechanics. We can't even tell you what this game is about. But you can trust me when I say... This game filled my roguish heart with genuine glee and wonder in a way I so rarely find in a box. And it did so six or seven distinct times. You can only play this one once. It is re-giftable, but you can only play it once yourself. And it is great to play alone. I beseech you to check it out. Okay, so, so, so what... What can you say about it to, like, get us to go spend the 40, 50 bucks, whatever it costs? Because that's no small investment. You're saying, you're pitching it as, I can't tell you anything, can't show you anything, but spend your money on this. You gotta, you gotta give us more. Box one evolves on you. You start off thinking that you're playing one game, and then you find out, oh, wait, I'm playing a different game. And then you say, oh, no, 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 I was wrong five minutes ago, I'm not playing that game. Oh, wow. And oh, wow. Oh, wow. It changes on you every minute you play it. And again, they've learned their lesson. It gives you a reason to solve every puzzle in this box. It gives you stakes to solve it. Neil Patrick Harris's game, Amazed, is kind of what it says on the tin. It's very boring. Box one has nothing on the tin. 
and it doesn't disappoint. All right, all right, you sold me. You sold me. I'll check it out. I will. So I'm I'm still a little skeptical. So forty bucks is a lot for a game that I can only play once. But I love I love NPH. NPH is amazing. Yeah, me too. And that's the thing is like so so you've got me on the hook. Here's here's where my question for and this isn't this isn't a review, obviously. This is just your impressions. Mm-hmm. One, I'd like to know about the components. Like, are there are there components to the box that are more than just like? Because like, amazed, I think was just like the board and some markers to go around the board. When I've seen box one back when I was like, oh god, this game. Like, I saw things like a pen and like a, a coin involved. Like, these are things I can talk about a little bit because they're in the marketing materials. Right. For your money, like that's my first question. What does it feel like? It's worth forty bucks. The second thing is, is this a game? If I'm only going to play it once, is this a game that I'm going to beat in an hour? There is definitely more to the game than you see in the marketing materials. It is worth the money. Cool. It took me, it honestly took me about two days, but it took me probably two to three hours of concerted effort to play. This is a this is a game that's kind of up your alley, though. So I would say that like it that, is. that to me seems like okay, like maybe that's going to be more like four or five hours for me, just given the different kinds of games we play. Uh, it's possible. Yeah. It's possible. We we've got a couple of these uh, copies floating around in the Corex and Cough family here, so I wouldn't be surprised if one of them made its way to you, Keegan, <laughs> without you spending forty bucks. But oh, that's good. sadly, our listeners are not so lucky. And I just I just want to say, you know, we we've been talking about replayability a few times in this podcast. I'm saying this as someone who's actually a huge proponent of replayability in board games. I want to be able to play my games over and over and over again. But the reality is, if you spend 40 bucks on an evening's worth of entertainment with your buddies and you can split that five different ways, I mean, you're going to spend easily that 40 bucks, you know, out at the bar or out at the movies or whatever you do. Um, So that is not, if even if you can only play it once, that is not a high ticket to play for you know, a, a, an evening of entertainment that you're going to remember. But replay building board games, we're going to have to... As long as you remember it. <laughs> as long as you remember it, right? We'll, we'll, we'll save replayability. Yeah, if you can only play it once and it's... Eh. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll save this issue for some no. other podcast. Okay, so check out, check out Neil Patrick Harris's new board game, Rick, is what you're saying. Yeah, box one. Okay, Keegan, what do you got? All right, so my number one game, I know I said these were no in particular order, but I, this actually, if I was you know, forced to give these in order, this would be my number one. This game is called You Died, and I can't give you the year because it's currently in beta testing, so technically 2019-ish, but it technically isn't out yet, although you can get involved. It's, uh, I think, pay what you want right now. It's designed by... Giles Penford and art by Edward York. And the simplest overview I can give of the game is this. This game is a solo RPG using what's called the Caltrop Core system. It's an open source system that you can create RPGs on. Mm -hmm. And this game is basically Dark Souls or Bloodborne or Demon Souls, whichever game, Sekiro, whichever game you, uh, you can remember from the From Software family. But it's an RPG and it's Soul crushing, it is bone breaking, it is existential, it is it is a fight uphill with bamboo shoots in the fingernails, all just trying to complete your quest. And it's amazing. Keegan, we we need to take you to like a therapist or the beach or take you on a walk or like somewhere with vitamin D, like a lot of vitamin D, somewhere that can help your soul at like a full spectrum flashlight. I don't know, man. <laughs> so just because we were dropping fun Batman facts, nearly every bad guy in the Batman universe is a therapist. So let's keep that in mind. Psychologist specifically. And uh, this game does have a beach setting. It, is it just Cthulhu again? You learn too much and you go nuts? Pretty much. No, this game is more slamming your head into a brick wall, all the while taking chip after chip after chip of that brick wall and eventually bashing through it. That is the core gameplay. To be clear, I was talking about that. <laughs> oh, yes. No, that is just Batman. But yeah, there is also, by the way, Pete, a beach setting with giant crabs and, and soul crushing on Wii. So I have my beach in this game. Way to ruin the beach for me, dude. They found a way to mimic this oppressive, apocalyptic fantasy setting that Dark Souls and all the From Software games just nail. And they mimic the leveling up system, which is really cool. 
where sort of like in D and D and any other leveling up system, but the the more you want to buy like more and more points in your strength or dexterity, the cost goes up, so you have to kill more things and grind more things. But if you die, you lose all of your progress. So keep that in mind. The game is played over three acts, and then you get a boss battle. You use deck of cards to help you build those three acts. Seven of clubs is a certain monster, an ace is a boss, that kind of thing. And if you survive, you win. You make it make it all the way through all three acts and the boss battle. And if you don't, you die. And the game is just done. Your character is gone, you have to re-roll. So the question might be, Keegan, what are the pros? Well, self, let me tell you. <laughs> There's very few components for such a big, intense game. So that's one of the main things. As I'm describing it, I can find myself being like, oh, Keegan, you are making it sound like this is the most Euro of Euro games ever. And it's not. So it's very, very few components, primarily using dice rolls and, and decks of cards. And they even recommend using like D4s and pens and pencil and paper to kind of track things. You can use D6s, actually, sorry, to track the game resources, and D4s help you win during combat. Helps you decide what you're doing. Only those two dice, which is kind of an interesting thing. So, a lot, and, I, and I liked this game for that reason, because I know, for me, I have like four bags of dice, and these dice just sit around. So I'm always looking for games that are not D&D necessarily, or not big tabletop games that let me use those dice. And the D4 doesn't get a lot of love. No, it doesn't. Although I assume it must in a, a system called Caltrop Core. Yeah. In addition, <laughs> I, I can also, he, I can feel the audience pulling back and I can feel you two pulling back. There are cons to this game, aside from the whole, you know, staring into the darkness and slowly thinking about your own existence. I, I spend most of my life trying to come up with coping skills to avoid doing that very thing. Yeah, this game is not going to help you. And and that's sort of my first con to this game. It's a number one for me, but this is a I, I keep saying this is good for me because Dark Souls is already not for anyone, which is the understatement of the century. Uh, difficult games are fun for me because I like the oppressive... Sorry, did you mean everyone or anyone? <laughs> I meant everyone. Okay, because you said anyone, and it sounded very accurate. <laughs> yeah, that was a Freudian slip. So the Dark Souls is already not for everyone. Difficult games are fun for me because I like that oppressive, dark world, and I like the idea of tabletop RPGs that fall into this. Pretty famously, I'm a huge fan of the, of the Bloodborne board game series. This is kind of the same thing, but it's definitely a, a dividing line. The thing that came to me when I was thinking about this whole game was that people like to win, and if you like to win... This game is not for you because it's more like Tetris in that you can't win. You can only not lose as badly each time. In my own playthrough, I sort of found myself realizing that when I had won, it was a sigh of relief that I got to stop playing, if that makes sense. But I didn't, that didn't make me want to stop playing going into it. It's, it's, it was more like running a marathon than anything else. And I can really understand that people may not like that. Winning is generally the reason we play games. So here's the question. You say this game is difficult. Yeah. Is it the sort of thing where you can get good and win? Yes. Or is it just that bad in terms of luck? Yes. So I should I should clarify. It is a it is oppressive, but it is definitely winnable. And it you do get better. And much like the roguelikes and and the Souls-like games, as you spend money on your, like as you spend your, um, I can't remember the word off the top of my head they use, but the soul energy to buy your levels, you do get stronger, and those things don't go away. Once you've bought the, once you've bought the, the extra points for your character, as long as your character's alive, they are getting stronger. Um, and there are healing items and stuff too. So like, there are parts of it that are, it is forgiving. It is not, it is not unfair. Right. I think is the best way I can put it. Gotcha. Important. One last thing I wanted to point out about this game, You Died currently has a very cool community. There are Reddit boards, there are message boards in general, there's a Discord server. Because it's a beta, people are talking about ways to improve the game, the creators are incredibly responsive. I mean, it's really a cool community. But coming from video games, and this is another thing that I think may have already turned people off, and so I do want to mention it. The group that follows the From Software games is incredibly toxic and and um, in a way that is like 
I'm not being controversial saying this. And so currently the community is great. I do worry a little bit about games like this entering the, t the tabletop RPG space because I worry that people are going to become toxic. You know what I'm saying? Like it becomes an attrition battle thing and it's just not what I'm about. So right now it's great. I do worry about more games like this. So so ha hang on, hang on. Pause, 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 pause. I'm not sure this is something that we should be talking about in this space, about criticizing other groups for being toxic. I don't know. I feel like it's pretty important to mention that like, because like the, the, the attrition battle gaming thing and the you have to get good or you suck community has really taken a huge hit out of the like, from software community. So like, I think it's worth mentioning because I think people will be, I don't know, people like, I, I was worried about it with this game. That's why I even took the time to become part of the community. So I don't know. I think for fans of this that are already sold on it, it's important to know this is a pretty cool community. So you're saying, wait, wait you're saying it's cool or it's toxic? I don't understand. The from software game community is well known in the industry for being incredibly toxic. Yeah. This game community is really cool. And I, and I worry about it becoming toxic, so people should be clear. Okay, all right. That was my whole right. point. All right, cool, all right. And I'm coming at this from a fan, so I should specify, this is a well-known thing in the fan fandom. Obviously, not everybody is toxic, but there is a toxic element that's fairly loud, and maybe that's the more fair thing to say. And I hope, as I see more of these games enter the tabletop community, that that sort of get good scrub, you know, you suck because you can't beat the boss with no weapons. I hope that that community maybe stays out of this community and it stays beautiful because what the what the creators of You Died have put together is pretty beautiful and I hope it stays that way. And it's something that we see in the Bloodborne, like the, the Come On Games is Bloodborne, uh, a pretty cool, solid community. So that's to, to, so Pete, I do want to thank you for bringing that up and I'm just going to like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to back it up. Like he's, Pete's right. I want to be very clear about the words I'm using. You are right, I think, in saying it's it's a vocal part of the community that is negative and, you know, bullying. One good counter to that is to make sure that you're you're loud about your positivity in the space. Because it's very easy to just stay silent when people, you know, come in and move on in on your community. Yeah. It can be important to put give some pushback and, and encourage people who are new to the space. Yeah. I think Pete's doing good modeling for that. So these are these are not <laughs> simple these are important but not simple problems to solve when it comes to any community um especially one that you feel like you are a member of and are invested in or passionate about so 110 percent. I, I i hope it is a both a boon and a concern that we're all sympathetic to should we talk about my number one game which is yeah i think we should we should get, we should wrap this up we're getting late yes let's yeah so getting back to the games, although, you know, things about a community are, are critically important. So Keegan, I'm really glad you brought that up and we, we talked about it. I mentioned that in solo gaming, for the most part, I have a hard time being emotionally invested or committing the emotional energy more accurately to setting up games that take 20 minutes, half an hour, if I'm playing them on my own. If I'm playing with other people, I'm all about it. On my own, it's harder for me. I would say that uh, Arkham Horror, the card game, and games like um, This War of Mine are kind of at my limit for the most part. But a game that I will set up and set up again and again and again and again and play by myself is Mage Knight. Mage Knight? So is that like power gaming, min-maxing, jerk at the table? Or is there a different it's, thing? It, it's that, but it's being awesome and looking darn cool while you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I gotta say, this was a tempting one for me as well. So take yeah, that like you will. Rick and I had to fight for putting who was going to put this game on their list. Well, I'm excited to hear about this. I don't think I I don't think I know Mage Knight. Yeah, and 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 Pete was uh, better optimized, so he wins this round. <laughs> Again, min maxing. Min maxing. Uh, so, base game was, re was released in 2011 um, by Wids Kids. I actually own currently. I had the original Mage Knight, but I traded it a number of years ago. And my current edition of Mage Knight is Mage Knight Ultimate Edition from 2018, which contains the base game as well as the Lost Legion expansion, the Shades of Tesla expansion, the Krang character expansion. Uh, wait, did you say Krang? Does that come with a Terradrome, or is that sold separately? I mean, that would be awesome. Actually... Hello to the three people who that joke was. So, so 
my my parents um, are in the process of doing a call in their the house that they've had for decades. I, I, I don't know if they'll stay in this house for another 10 years or not, but they're calling some stuff that they've collected. So they're going through, you know, you know, box after box after box. And my dad will send me pictures of some of the stuff that he's uncovered, unearthed from our childhood. And about a month ago, he sent me a picture of a drawing of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Technodrome that I had drawn when I was like eight. And it was horrible. It was like this wireframe drawing of the Technodrome, but it was clearly my art without a signature. And he was like, does, that, does this belong to any of you? And I had to text the group, my siblings and my dad and my mom. And I was like, yeah, that, that's my artwork from when I was eight years old. And they made fun of me. So you kept it, right? Your heritage is important. It's not that I kept it, it's that I said to my dad, please don't throw that away without consulting with me. Because <laughs> it's not something I want in my house, but it's not something that I want destroyed yet. I don't know. Childhood is weird. So Mage Knight. <laughs> Corex and Coffee is not taking a hard stance on protecting our heritage. <laughs> Mage Knight is an amazing game <laughs> that you can play solo as well as with your friends. But it's got comprehensive integrated rules text. The expansions have new cards and new miniatures with alternate paint jobs. The game is role playing plus deck building plus having a board for, like from a board game combination. Each player controls one of four powerful mage knights as you explore and conquer every corner of the mage knight universe within the Atlantean Empire. You build an army, you fill a deck with powerful spells and actions, you explore caves and dungeons and conquer powerful cities. Basically, you dream every dream that an eight-year-old could possibly dream. And you live it out in this game through scenarios and creating powerful allies and being able to claim lands as your own. What eight-year-olds are you talking to? <laughs> the, the prince was supposed to be a satire. Okay, sorry. That's, that is a joke for one person. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think I might have been talking to like eight-year-old Elon Musk. I don't know. <laughs> we hate you, Elon. <laughs> hey, Elon, wow. Elon, come be on our podcast. We're cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit in farts. I'm going to edit in so many farts when he comes on. <laughs> uh, so, it, it, <sighs> so, Mage Knight is what we were talking about, Keegan. <laughs> and... It's, it's a role-playing game in a box. It seems like you might be stretching solo game a little bit here. I know we all have, but like... No, we have. We have. But like many of these games you can play with other people, but you can play all of these games, including Mage Knight, by yourself. And I have played Mage Knight by myself three or four times. I've gone through the entire game. I've committed dozens and dozens of hours of playing this game on my own. And it's a game that not only do I play at the table, but when I'm not at the table, I think about it on my own. It calls me back when I'm away. And I feel a drive to re-engage with the solo campaign when I'm not there. And when I'm back at the table, I'm so glad that I have. I, I, I'm happy when I do. So, so one of the best things about playing Mage Knight as a solo game is it is so fiddly. You have so many systems and so many very important choices. And when you're playing by yourself, there's nobody else to be rude to by actually taking your time and actually making yeah. those choices. So I've, I've found a lot of people actually believe that Mage Knight is better played alone for that reason. Interesting. Rick, I think you're absolutely right. And because it's so fiddly, I can spend 15, 20 minutes diving into a rules explanation and not worry about other players becoming impatient because they're waiting on me for their turn. I can just read for 20 minutes, pace around my apartment, think about what I want to do based on how I want to interpret that rule and then come back to the table and be like, okay, all right. You can go for a run and come back after inspiration strikes. Exactly, and be like, okay, based on how I understand that rule and based on my current game state, I'm going to do this. And in my table rules for multiplayer games, that's all very strictly frowned upon. Right, yeah. You can't do a rules lawyer for 20 minutes and then go for a run and then do a stretch session and be like, let's refresh and then come back to the table. Other, everyone will have left. But you can do that when you solo a game, which is wonderful. Because you're the only one who cares and you care about this, so figure it out. 
I, w- I will say, though, that Mage Knight has all of the wonderfully dripping and delicious thematic component delight of 1950s fantasy pulp. But I think Mage Knight has slightly more direction than that, in that it's kind of a combination of 1950s pulp, but having the direction of David and Leigh Edding's fantasy novel series of the 1980s. So it's certainly not going to feel like that for the first 20 hours of you playing the game because it's so complex, which is one of the cons. I would love to tell you that playing the game feels like trudging through, like, an incredibly thematic and narratively immersive experience of the complexities of a George R. R. Martin novel, right? But it's not. It's not that smooth. So I'm just going to interject here and ask if there are any comparisons to Margaret Wise and Tracy Hickman or Dragons of the Autumn Twilight or anything that fans can finish out their bingo cards, because we've dropped a lot of fun names here. I mean, it's just, there's such a steep learning curve around the game. That you know you're you're <laughs> you're you're looking up icon after icon in the rules reference and looking up rules clarifications on one page or another, which you can do if you're solo gaming and not piss off other players. Mm-hmm. It really feels like you've walked into George R. R. Martin's office and he's gone on vacation, but you're seeing all of these, you know, posters and diagrams and like charts and marker lines of things going to, you know, family lineages and things like this. And, you know, just all of his notes without a novel. And then with him on vacation, you just have his notes and you have to basically construct a novel based on George R. R. Martin's notes. And that is what playing Mage Knight feels like. And you're on your own because the show is now caught up to the writing and everybody needs to know what happens next. It feels a little bit like like Stephen King hugging Orskin Scott Card while they're hanging out with Mary Shelley. I'm sorry, we're just dropping all these names and I just I gotta pick them all back up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. I you know, looking at my notes, is uh is that it? I feel like we could discuss this topic for a hundred years, but we might have already been doing that. Maybe even a thousand years. Old vampire. Note to future Keegan, add cricket sounds here. I don't even know what we're talking Honestly, I think we are we're getting close to the end of time. What do you Yeah, we got we gotta wrap it up here. That that is we actually made it through our top twelve list as we define it, which is <laughs> which is four games that Pete likes, four games that Rick likes, and four games that Keegan likes within the genre or opponent structure, more accurately, of solo gaming. Or games mm-hmm. that can be played solo. And one game we all hate called <laughs> Amazed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. But check out Box One. He was trying his best, damn it. He was trying so good. If you're upset, then you can email us and 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 we'll forward those those complaints to Rick and he can deal with them. So thank you so much for listening to the season two, episode ten, Corax and Coffee Cast finale we will be off but we will be back for season three and we have a really cool lineup of topics to talk about at that point including at some point in the season having my own brother be a guest on the show hooray nice hooray so please do like and subscribe to our content check out our website at www.corexandcoffee.com please consider supporting us on patreon or through our merch store I'm your host, Pete Steele. And I'm your other host, Rick Hendricks. And I'll be recording a fun outro, but for now, it will always be Keegan King. We hope to see you at the gaming table soon. Until next time, take care, stay safe, and please be well all. Take care. Bye. See you in just a second, everybody. See? Told ya. I'm going to keep today short and sweet because, well, I need the break. Your top two guys to talk about games on the Corax and Coffee podcast were Pete Steele and Rick Hendricks. Obviously, I'm still Keegan King, editor, producer, and dodger of responsibilities. Well, of the fun ones, anyway. The terrible ones do manage to keep me busy. Joking aside, it has been my pleasure to work on this show and have the help of some amazing people in the background, including our patrons and people who buy our merch, and even people who review us in strongly worded voicemails. If you feel like supporting us, you can rate, you can review, you can find cool stuff on our merch store, you can read our content, or you can just come hang out. We've got social media and everything. We're going to go on a little bit of a break, but we will see you soon. We will post updates on our social media and on the site, so keep your eyes peeled. 
You'll also have more content like unboxing videos and previews and reviews and all kinds of stuff. And next season, there'll be some weird show notes. Maybe if you guess all the songs that season, I'll send you a sticker or a shout out or something. Maybe not. Maybe next season, who knows? I'll put in quotes from Kierkegaard, despite, despite the fact that both Pete and Rick would want to stop me. Remember, I'm an agent of chaos. And now, the last quote of the week. It all seemed so very arbitrary. I applied for a job at this company because they were hiring. I took a desk at the back because it was empty. But no matter how you get there or where you end up, human beings had this miraculous gift to make that place home. Corax and Coffee. Tabletop gaming. Caffeinated. <laughs>